Well, let's begin at the beginning. Welcome to the first ever episode of Armchair History with Sam. I'm your host, Alex Lenning, Executive Director here at the St. Albans Museum. We're speaking today with Jim Murphy, one of our board members, a good friend, and a railroad veteran, all about the history of the rail city. So Jim, why is St. Albans known as the rail city? Well, Alex, that's, that's a difficult question to answer right offhand. Uh, of course, it's always been a, a railroad town since the late 1840s. The railroad city, I have a feeling it started somewhere in the, late 1940s or going into the 1950s when they started using the logo with a little small steam engine up on top of the paperwork. It's a rail city this, rail city that. They had a rail city salon here in town. Everybody was using the name rail city. Uh, so I, I'm kind of guessing around to that time period. But uh, it became the rail city because definitely that's what it was. They, the railroad came into town here. First train in the town was October 18th of 1850. And there was very few buildings here at the time because it was just really starting up. But they came into town, and a, a lot of people talked about the, as we know, as a lot of people, the Center Lot Railroad or Railway. There's a lot of rail name changes because of when they reorganized. But the, uh, the railroad, when it first started here, was the Vermont and Canada Railroad. And what was the purpose? Um, purpose was to connect up with another railroad being built from Windsor, Vermont into Essex Junction called the Vermont Central Railroad. John Smith of St. Albans, uh, Joseph Clark of Milton, and Mr. Uh, Brainerd uh, from St. Albans started the one from Essex Junction through here over into Ralsis Point, where eventually they were going to make a connection there up into Montreal. And they made it into St. Albans, as I said, in October of, of 1850. Uh, got in the Ross's Point later that year, and the other railroad was the Vermont Central being built by Charles Payne of Northfield, who was the governor in, in 1840. And if you look at it, look at all the people who were in charge of the railroads. Uh, John Smith was a congressman. Uh, all these men had political positions where they, they, they used for building up their railroads. So the two railroads met at Essex Junction and continued on. So you had a, a continuous railroad from the Connecticut River in Windsor all the way up through into uh, Ross's Point where it connected up to the railroad. Down in below Windsor, it was the Sullivan County Railroad in New Hampshire that ran down through. They, they connected up there and it continued on through down into um, Brattleboro, down into Boston. Uh, they just spread out like a spider web. I mean, you looked everywhere. Everybody, almost every town in the state of Vermont petition to build a railroad in their town. No matter where it was going to be, they were doing it. So those two railroads ran that way. The one in the Vermont Center, which came out of Windsor, actually went in through Winooski and into Burlington. That, that was the, the main uh, railroad where they connected. We connected here for the Vermont Canada at Essex Junction. They worked together. Charles Payne of the uh, Vermont Central noticed that the people up here in St. Albans were having trouble paying for what they were doing, building the railroad. They're having money paying for it. Where their money came from was various places, but they, they just didn't uh, have it. So Charles Payne, and they make a brief, said, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll lease your railroad from you. I'll pay you so much money. Uh, you will still have your job as the president of the railroad. You'll have your own office in this building in St. Albans, but I'll be the one who does the, the controlling of the railroad. He said, we'll continue finishing building your railroad for you. And John Smith probably said, that sounds like a, a pretty good idea. Charles Payne said to him, well, and if I miss the payment, I miss the lease payment, you get your railroad back with all the finishing work I've done on it, and you owe nothing. So I think you're sort of going there, but what was the advantage for this community to have this connection and this sort of relationship? It was the thing to do. I mean, it was, this is, of course, I don't know if we were called uh, a dairy town at, at the time, up here in 1850. There had to be dairies. Of course, a lot of it in Vermont was, was sheep. There was sheep all over the place for a while. Uh, uh, G, um, Mr. Smith here in town, he was called a gentleman farmer. So if he was called a gentleman farmer, then maybe there was farming him up there. I don't know when the, the, the Franklin County Creamery started up, but you had, if you had that, then you would have grain brought in. Um, they built their own engines here. Mm -hmm. They built their own cars. They've, it was truly 
when you graduated from high school, back in the 1930s, let's say, the automatic thing was to go to work for the railroad. So it was the largest employer. And yeah, it was the largest employer. They brought them in, but that brought in the grain companies, they brought in the creameries, uh, the foundry, they made their own rails here in town, they made metal parts. Uh, so it became really uh, a, a railroad to be reckoned with. Uh, but then uh, Charles Payne made it a little bit easier. He said, and if you do, if I do miss, you get your railroad back, but you get my railroad too. Wow. And all, all the boys up here must have said, hey, that's, that's a pretty good idea, yeah? So they went through with it. Well, Charles Payne missed the lease, and I expect all the lawyers for the Vermont and Canada were up here sitting right on the front porch waiting for the lease to, to go, and they took it over and started running it. That's when uh, John Smith ran up until 19, 1858 when he died, then J. Gregory Smith took over running along with his, his, his other son. And they ran around, but it brought in all this industry into St. Albans, more and more and more. At one time, it was um, uh, about 1,400 people working at the railroad at the same time. So I think you kind of gave us some really good perspective on you know, the economic advantages and how you know, this transportation hub sort of came to be. Um, thinking about St. Albans a little more specifically, like what is it about our location and our geography uh, that allowed us to serve not only Vermont, but New England and, and Lake Champlain in Canada from where we are? What's special about St. Albans being the hub for this well, railroad? Well, it, it, they wanted that westward route heading across the top of the United States and that fit in to what they were building up through here, continue on from Boston up through this way or from Portland, Maine across this way, over through the Great Lakes, all the way over into uh, Chicago and spread out from there. And that was just that westward bound movement and it worked very good for the, the pe people up here in Vermont. It, they had the people up here and they just built and built. I, I'm not a really good at explaining it piece by piece, but the thing is, uh, it just came up here and, and it started. Everybody wanted to have a railroad. Um, I think beyond uh, looking at how this was able to sort of serve as transport for industry, were people moving around on trains too at this time? Yes. How else would you do it? You had horse and buggies back then. The old story for the state of Vermont, every town is built seven miles apart <laughs> right. because of the horse and buggy. As far as you want to go in a day, it was seven miles away and seven miles back. And if you look at the stations, every town around seems to be about seven miles, no matter which direction you, you travel. Some are closer, but railroad stations, they had stations every two miles for people to get on, a tra on off a train. And it was the interesting thing about on Sunday travel, they didn't travel on Sundays because the religious ones did not like, you don't travel on a train on Sundays. But so they put a Bible in there like the motels did, and they, oh, they wow. took it out and then all of a sudden now that it was okay to run a train on Sundays. No. But the, the industry up here, the things they did in St. Albans, they made their own rails. The grain company, they made their own engines, they made their own parts. Uh, you didn't need to ship it out to someplace else to have it done. It was self-sufficient. Do it here. Everything you needed was right here. Right here. Their carpenter work, their upholstery work for all the cars that were done were done here. Well, and let's talk about the, the CVR. Um, what's kind of their story? How successful were they? Central Railway did very good. Now, what happened there is that the two railroads got together, the Vermont Central Vermont Canada. Eventually, they changed their name to the Central Vermont Railroad around in the 1870s. So they became one railroad, a Central Vermont Railroad. They kept that name up until mid-1890s. They went the railroad incorporated, and it kept changing every time. But the railroad grew and grew and grew all the time. They got their connection through the Montreal via the Grand Trunk Railroad, which got them into Montreal. They had a, a route up through saint Armand, Quebec, up to St. John's. They had the Richard branch going up to Richard. Uh, everywhere you go, you had branch lines running all over Vermont that the CV Railway connected to and could move this traffic almost anywhere they wanted to go. Uh, they uh, made a good connection. J. Gregory Smith even had a steamship line from uh, uh, Augsburg out through into Chicago and the Great Lakes. Um, he leased the railroad from the New London Northern, which came up from New London, Connecticut, which had a steamship line from New York City up to New London. So when he got done, when he became the president of the Northern Pacific Railroad in the 1860s, he had a complete transportation line from New York City to New London, all the way up through into here, across to Augsburg, steamship out, and then again from there, been west to the, uh, the west coast. And all of that based out of St. Albans. All based out of St. Albans, wow. one man. 
Uh, you know, that seems almost impossible. He really went after it. He and his brother worked together. Um, John Smith died in 1891, but Edward Curtis Smith was there. That's his son. Edward Curtis Smith took over running the railroad. He was a governor in 1898, of course. I mean, it goes and goes and goes. But uh, they ran the railroad. What happened around 1895, because J. Gregory Smith had overextended himself, all these leases to pay them off, they just didn't have the money. So they lost most of the leases of the railroads they had. They went out to other railroads. The railroad, Rutland Railroad took over part of it. The Grand Truck actually took over the Central Vermont Railroad. That's when they reorganized and changed their name a little bit. But they didn't buy it, but they had it through stock. And they ran it up until about 1923 when the Canadian National Railway came about. And they took over the Grand Trunk. So the Canadian National now had control of the Central Vermont Railway. Central Vermont Railway um, lasted right up until the end, until uh, February of uh, 1995. Um, they, uh, the CN Railroad, which owned them, after the 1927 flood hit, it washed out the railroad so much the Central Vermont Railway could not repair them, but the Canadian National had controlling stock over the Central Vermont. So they sent down all their people to work. Um, there were 1,600 speakers, I mean, French-speaking men that came down from Canada to work with. One of the men was an Italian down here trying to talk French to the people, and he said, that was quite a job, <laughs> uh, Charlie Morel. And so they took it over, and then they sent the bill to the Central Vermont Railway pay for what we did for you to get the railroad rebuilt in four months. And the Central Vermont Railroad did not have the money, so it went to a foreclosure auction where the railroad was sold and bought by the Canadian National for $22 million wow. in 1929. So that's when the Canadian National took it over and ran it, but they still kept the name as the Central Vermont Railway. And the company incorporated, they kept bouncing around, but it ended up as a, a good railroad. Thank goodness the Canadian National had taken control, I think, that if it had been for the Canadian National, the railroad might not have been here anymore after the 27th flood. They would not mm -hmm. have the, the business because Canadian National was sending everything down here. The trains are coming down here. Eventually their diesels came down here. Um, you saw Canadian National steam engines running through here. Uh, it, was, it was Canadian National. And then, as I say, they, they sold the rail techs in 1995. Around, I think it was around 2000, the Rail America took over them. And then now it's Genesee and Wyoming is running the railroad, doing a great job. They're painting their engines here in town, all the orange and black colors you're seeing around town, but it's being done here in St. Albans. So that goes back to what, when the railroad was starting, they did their own work here. They repair their engines here. They don't have to ship them all over the place to work on them. Uh, the guys in the shop have got 30 hands all the time because they're working in grease and oils and everything else. But they're doing it all here in St. Albans, which is very important. It's an interesting life cycle from this, this railway that sort of started out um, and was able to be successful because of this lease to expand across the entire country yep. into this sort of huge endeavor and then only to have leases sort of be the, the economic downfall um, and then to be saved by uh, a buyout from another yep. company and to come right back to St. Albans again. Right. It's back to St. Albans again. The, um, it was really interesting, the, the whole railroad, the way it's gone all, all over the years. I, well, of course, I worked there for years and years and years, it seems. And, well, let's talk about that for a minute, Jim. Can you kind of give us your, your backstory and yeah, your well, involvement with the railroad? I, I lived on Nason Street in St. Albans, and my playground was what they call Beartown. And that's the main track between Lake Street and south of St. Albans. There was a switch yard down there. They switched out and did the grain company. I played in the yards down there, but I never thought about going to work for the railroad. My grandfather worked for three different railroads. My father, at 16 years old, was the, in, taking a, a job in the shops as a boilermaker and he could not, could not get passed by eighth grade in school. His grandmother had to sign for him to be able to go to work in, in the railroad. So my job was, I didn't think about going to work. I had other things planned in high school. And all of a sudden, George Jackson, who was the chief train dispatcher in St. Albans, I was going with his daughter, Sandy. At that time, we'd been going together for a couple of years. They had this class they put on to teach telegraphy, station work, freight work, and things to do with the railroad three nights a week during the school year, uh, Mondays, Wednesdays, and Friday nights for two hours every night. And he came and offered it to me. And I says, well, I thought that was for seniors only. He says, well, I can give it to who I want because uh, I'm in charge of the class. <laughs> so I took the class for that, those nine months, had time off, went to my senior year in high school, and about four months before I graduated, Mr. Jackson called me up and said, you're coming to work for us? 
I said, sure. And, uh, you go back to the 1930s. Got out of school, went to work for the railroad. I got out of school on a Friday night. Monday, I was in Milton, Vermont, breaking in as a, as a telegraph operator, which I'd already learned the code, learned how to sell tickets and do train work and train orders and all the other things, make trains run up and down. And then gradually worked into a different job, what they call a spare telegrapher. I covered vacations for people, how many off, off sick, anywhere between uh, Albury, Vermont, and Windsor. I covered the stations up and down the line. I wasn't the only one. There was quite a few of us around that did this, but that's how I got into it. Then in 1965, I became a spare train dispatcher. I finally had uh, enough seniority I could hold a regular job. Most of the time it was at Swanton Station. And then I, I worked on Swanton, but I became a spare train dispatcher again, covering vacations and covering sick time. And then uh, the word got out to the Canadian National was moving the dispatcher's office to Montreal. And the only job I could have, either drive to Montreal every day to be a dispatcher, or the other job at the one that was seniority would only get me into New London, Connecticut. So I left the railroad on my own in 1968. I worked at GE for two years. I worked at IBM. I worked at a prefab building place here in town. I worked at uh, University of Vermont Medical Photography. Um, and then I got laid off from there because it was a job they ran out of money. It was a state job, and the doctor didn't have the money to pay me anymore. So a month after I got out of there, they called me from WCAX TV. Stuart Hall, the weatherman, says, you heard you're out of work, looking for a job. And he was 50-50 right, but I wasn't too, too anxious. But I said, OK, I went down there, worked for them for eight years. The railroad calls me back in 1979, said, dispatcher's office is back in St. Albans. Come on back to work. So in the spring of 1980, I returned back to work, started as a, a porter, checker, sealer, janitor, because I lost all my seniority. I had to start all over again. Wow. Worked my way up through. In 1982, I was a spare train dispatcher again. 1988, back to full-time dispatching, and retired in October 1st of 1999 as a full-time dispatcher. Got to know the railroad by heart. Uh, when Railtex took it over, they offered me the job as chief train dispatcher for the whole Railtex uh, community across the United States. It would have been nice if it had been 10 years ago, but I only had two years ago to retire, and I didn't figure it was fair for me to be, because I'd be on the road for six months a, a sure. year. So I said no, but they tried and tried and tried, but I still retired. And uh, that's pretty well my railroad history. And a year and a half later, I went to work for a, a contractor in Burlington as a flag went on the railroad, protecting other contractors. I, I do that now still. And uh, so, but railroading in my blood, 1972 got me into the history. I was not I was what I call a Friday employee. And people say, what's a Friday employee? That's when I got my paycheck. I could care about anything about the history. But all of a sudden, it came into the history of one little thing. It was the St. Jane L.C. Railroad that got me into it, which got me into the different change of names on the Central Railway. From mm -hmm. there, it grew and grew and grew to the point where uh, now I'm up to my neck here in alligators. And <laughs> <laughs> but I love it. History in school meant nothing to me. Uh, but now it's really, really fun. That's awesome, Jim. Can you just tell me a little bit about what visitors can see in the railroad room at the St. Albans Museum if they come in for a tour? There's, this is, it surprises a lot of people that first come in. They don't want to come in and they don't want to come in. But after they've been here, they've been here a couple hours, they say we've never seen this kind of a museum anywhere. There's something here for almost everybody. Not everybody likes the railroad. People like the, the, the war room, the, the military room, the Smith people, the Aaron of the Smiths. Uh, uh, we had a relative from uh, Bennett Young here a week or so ago who visited sure. uh, from the raid. You know, We never were taught about the raid in high school, knew nothing about it. And the, the raid is fantastic by itself. But people can come in here and see these things. Uh, there are more and more people that we, we train ourselves to listen to other people talking about this history. They're all learning it. So our, our associates up here who are working are doing a great job uh, keeping this place going. So what can they find in the railroad room specifically? Well, what I like, why well, I've got a video, I show of different things that happen on the railroad, but I've got a payroll book up here. A lot of people come in and they find out that their grandfather worked for the railroad. And I look through the payroll book and I find their name and what they did and where they worked. And they're all excited about seeing, oh, my grandfather, you know my grandfather? You know, well, I'm, I'm up there enough to know their grandfather and probably their great grandfathers. <laughs> but they come in here and they learn things that they did not know. We have photographs here galore of, of, of the railroad. We can't put them all out, but uh, they are here to be, be seen. I wish I could spend all my time here, but it, it would take forever. We're actually sitting in a model sort of 
uh, rail about, ticket office, about right? About 1925 or so, what the, the telegraph office is set up here to look like. The ticket office is the same way, the waiting room. Uh, this would be the platform where the train went by. Um, you, have, you have to kind of close your eyes and, and look at what the thought back then. And the way the, tele the telegraph office is set up here was the way it was right up to the day they took out the telegraphy here in about 1972. It ran, this is the last year of railroad that we find out in the United States that still had the telegraph still usable in here. We could telegraph from station to station. We did Western Union telegrams. They went to Boston from here. We received them back in. Um, it was a, a busy, busy town, even, even, even in the 50s and 60s. Uh, they had the switcher in the yard. There was many, many switchers, but there is so much history beyond everything that goes on. I'm learning from other people. They're teaching me history, telling me their stories. That's what I want from the people That's in Sedona. That's what it's all about. Tell me your history. You've got your parents work for the railroad, your grandparents work for the railroad. Bring us your pictures of what you've got of your, your families. We can copy them and put them in our records. So now we've got your family recorded who they are, what they did for the railroad. You get your originals back. We won't keep them, well, if, unless you want to throw them, then we'll sure. take them. But the thing is, that is the history continued. And that's their job of promoting the history that it'll go and go and go and keep going. Even with different railroads coming over, that's still important as to what, what's going on within the railroad. So come on up and visit us. Um, uh, walk through and uh, get a feel for the place and then come up and uh, volunteer. We always like wild volunteers here. We do. And I think you've given us a great sense of kind of uh, this historical perspective on the railroad. Certainly we've seen the evolution in our community. You know, Lake Street once had, what, 20, 20, two, three tracks? There were 20, uh, 23 tracks across yeah. there at one time, yep. Um, obviously that's changed, some of the, the headquarters building and, and the rail shed and those things. Yep. In your mind, as someone who's been involved with this for, in one way or another for their entire life almost, uh, what do you kind of see as the legacy of the rail city and what's the future of rail look like? It's, it's hard for me to say, of course, I'm not mixed in directly with the Genesee in Wyoming. Uh, the Canadian National Railway still feeds this railroad with traffic out of, out of Canada. A lot of lumber comes down through, grain, oil products, and stuff down through here. Uh, back, I can remember coming in from Montreal, 100 car trains coming in. Now they're down to about probably 40, 50 cars a day. Uh, that's still nice. It'd be nice if they had more. Uh, but Genesee and Wyoming, is the largest freight hauler in the world. They, they started out as an eight mile railroad over in New York State at a salt mine. And look at them now. They're wow. the largest in the world, not the Vermont or the, but the largest in the rail. They're, they're moving, moving, and expanding, expanding, and expanding. Uh, there is a, a, a future for the railroads. They just put the welded rail in the last five or six years up here now, which is, you no longer have the clickety clack, clickety clack going down the rails anymore. It's a nice thing, but it's safer. The guys get out there, it rides better than people on Amtrak, right? It, because it, it's so quiet. Uh, we're hoping to get Amtrak through into Montreal eventually, sure. another year or two or three. We don't. It's what they get the, this up in Montreal, the center built up there where they can do the custom immigration work. That would be lovely that they get that train back in there into Montreal. It probably would change it to a night train out of Montreal, but you'd have a connection into getting into Washington in the morning, in the afternoon, you can catch a train out to uh, uh, Florida. Right now, you get in there and, uh, you know, and you've got to stay overnight to catch a train to Florida. Mm -hmm. So I'm hoping that when they get in here and get this set up, that they'll have Amtrak going through. Freight service, um, what happened at freight service was the interstate. Trucks sure. came in in 1955, 56, they built the interstate. A train used to stop, the local wafer would stop in Bethel, Vermont. Switch customers there for two or three hours. Same thing at South Royalton. They had that many customers. After the interstate came through, it got down to Bethel now has one customer. South Royalton has no customers. Randolph has no customers. The traffic is gone, it's all, it's all gone to trucks. But you watch the trains, if you get on the railroad videos, watch, you've got these piggyback trains, these trailers going back and forth. Across the country. There's probably a million of them out there running every day, all over the place. Your oil cars are running instead of one car at a time. It's like the Second World War, when they started moving these oil trains for a war effort, mm -hmm. they broke the record for how long it took to get a car of oil across the United States because everybody worked together. Sure. That is a little problem today. They don't all work together. Each railroad is separate. The New England Central makes a connection with the uh, 
uh, the railroad in um, just down Massachusetts, it's a Pan Am, they call it. Okay, you see the old Boston and Maine. Mm -hmm. So some traffic goes to them, or we go all the way through New London, Connecticut, where we pass all traffic down there, or to Willimatic. Um, you've got other railroads that you're relying upon. And the Vermont Railway comes into Burlington, delivers cars that we pick up every night and bring on and send it west, and we bring cars down to them every night. So we're still connecting with them. That, that railroad there by is doing a marvelous job of how they're handling things, the customers. And so it's still there, but it's not going to be as large as they want. They want to rebuild the passenger service. I don't see how they're going to do it. They wanted to put a high-speed rail from Boston to Montreal, and they said they're going to average 90 miles an hour to the mountains and the curves and the hills. 90 miles an hour just wouldn't fly up here. But faster speed train, that's when the railroad rail run, that went faster speed. Not, not high speed. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think Amtrak has allowed, you know, what they call the signal department, signal area, 79 miles an hour. Freight trains are still down at, at 40. Uh, but it, you have one train that goes out here at night around 10 o'clock. That goes all the way down into Palmer, Massachusetts, to different crews, different places. The, the Burlington job goes out of here about 10.30, 11 o'clock, goes into Burlington every night. You got the wood chip train that goes out of here every day, goes out of, out of Swamp down to Burlington where they burn wood chips which generates electricity for the boilers down there, the steam boilers, and generates electricity. Uh, what a marvelous uh, setup, you know what I mean? Here's all these scrub trees that they're not using anything for. Now they're chipping them all up and burning them and using them. It's almost as good as solar panels. <laughs> uh, so uh, it's, it's there, but it's going to take a lot of work for everybody to work together. I, I like to think that there you know, will always sort of be a special place for rail. Oh, yeah. In St. Albans, you know, you're sort of reminded of some of the repurposing that's happening, like, uh, you know, rail trails taking over yep. uh, unused areas. And um, as you probably know, our annual Maple Festival Carnival, the uh, amusement rides still come in by train. Um, so yep. it's just it's kind of neat to see how uh, rail and the rail city have evolved over the years and uh, what the future holds in store. Yeah, well, they had to you think, what is the people that come in for the fairgrounds? They, they want to come in there. They're train came into St. Albans, where they unloaded and took their stuff down for the fairgrounds. And yep. all. So it's there. Uh, Ringling Brothers and Barlow and Bailey are no more having a train because they've, they're they broken up now, but their trains ran for years on the rails. But uh, it's still good. Service is still uh, good on passenger trains, but they have a, a trouble running because Amtrak runs on somebody else's tracks. Amtrak owns from Boston to Washington. That's the Northeast Corridor. But every place else in the United States where they run, they pay the railroad to run on there. And the railroads make more money on freight than they do on Amtrak. So who's going to get the priority sure. ahead of time? And it's too bad they can't work out some other thing. For years, you had the Pennsylvania Railroad running here and the New York Central beside it, side by side. Then over the, when they merged, they took up that extra rail. Now it's only one rail going through. Uh, it makes it difficult to run a lot of traffic together. So. The freight trains, usually, if it's a van train, what they call with a piggyback and stuff like that, they a lot of time get priority over Amtrak to run. Hmm. I know they're not going to be happy when you're saying this, but that's one of those logical things that, where are you going to make the money? Are you going to throw money away and let Amtrak go? Or, but tr Amtrak is still there, and they're hopefully going to improve their systems more and more and more as they go. They're working on it. It's, it's going to come. I, one of my side, I watch my TV in the morning. I have a rail network. I can travel all over the United States and watch live trains running anywhere in the United States. Wow. And it's just for something to do in the morning when I have my coffee. Mm -hmm. I, I don't do it for the rest of the day. Uh, <laughs> I got more and more things to do. But watching those is going to a feeling of how many trains are out there every day running, 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 running. It's that we're not even aware of. You know, it's, right. it's not yeah. it's not the lost sort well, of, a lot of transportation people, mode that people might yeah, assume. Right. They don't they, 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 they people complain about, oh, I got held up at a crossing for five minutes. You know, because they got to wait for the train to go by. But just think, if that train wasn't running, all those tractor trailers would be on the highway. You'd be 10 minutes going to our stock crossing with exactly. all the traffic. So, like, But it's doing its job. But you need trucks. Trucks don't you know, uh, go to every area. The railroad doesn't go to every town. they got to move in and get their stuff delivered. So I'm not against truckers at all. It's just that the, uh, the through freight, cross-country stuff, put it on the train. Still a place for rail. Yep. Well, Jim, I, you know, uh, we've talked a lot today. And... Um, it's so clear that you can't tell the history of St. Albans without telling the history of uh, rail in town. Yeah, well, and so I appreciate you taking the time to sit down with us uh, in our new armchairs to talk about You're lucky uh, I only talked this long, not longer. <laughs> <I talked laughs> thank you so much, Jim. Okay, thank you very much. Appreciate it. 
And, and finally, as I early I spoke about, we're looking for pictures of your people who work for the railroad. Anything that to do with that stuff. But pictures are very important. Picture tells a story. Sometimes you see something in the foreground. It's the background part of the picture where it tells you a story. Give us a call. Bring a picture up. We'll copy it for you. We'll put it in our archives. You'll get your original back. There's no damage, no, no error. It won't be leaving here and being mailed to somebody else. It's done here at the museum. Well, thanks for joining us again here at the St. Albans Museum. We had a great talk with Jim Murphy on the history of the rail city. You can keep up to date with the St. Albans Museum online at www.stamuseum.org. Thanks again. We'll see you next time.